Sarah Bendel, I'm a material culture historian. I am thrilled to be joined today by Sarah Bendel, who is going to talk with us about some of the ins and outs of looking your best and dressing the part in early modern England. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, no, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to chat more about early modern dress. Well, tell us what first sparked your interest in the study of early modern dress and sort of the history of dress and fashion and how it influenced life. What got you started? Uh, I think it was uh, the sort of culmination of a couple of things. Um, Mainly my love of dressing up. I loved dressing up as a child. My mom had like a dress up box and... um, yeah, I always just loved sort of dressing up. Um, I also loved history when I was a child. So um, I always actually wanted to be uh, an archaeologist. Like if, if you had have asked me when I, was a, when I was a child or a teenager, what do you want to be? I always said I wanted to be an archaeologist. And I think that was because I was drawn to material things, the history of material things or um, what material things could tell us about history. Um, and when I was in my late teens and early 20s I also started to get into sewing as well um I was sort of developing my own style and I really liked vintage clothes but it was so expensive to buy vintage clothes or to buy reproduction vintage so I sort of decided to make them myself um so I taught myself how to sew um and then yeah, my love of dressing up, my love of history, my knowledge of sewing sort of came together for, I think my friend was having a birthday party and the theme was history. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make a historical costume. And when I was preparing to make it, I was researching and I thought, oh, this is actually a really, really interesting way to do history sort of through the lens of dress. And I was learning so much and it was so interesting. Um, And yeah, so after that, every time I got a chance to design my own uh, research question in sort of when I was at um, university in an undergraduate class, I tried to do something around dress. Um, And then, yeah, I just decided to keep pursuing history um, in an academic setting. And yeah, that's how I became a material culture slash dress historian. That is wonderful. And I love that idea of a lens into the past through something we do understand. You know, we're all wondering what to wear in the morning or how to look our best or as styles change and what that says about us and developing your own style. So that is fascinating. And what a great way to look at history. Yeah, and and it's such a fundamental human experience, right? You know, we all have to clothe our bodies. And, you know, sometimes we don't have a choice in what we wear and, you know, often now though we do. And so it it becomes, yeah, I think it's something that everybody now can relate to. And I think, you know, for example, um, dress or fashion exhibitions now are one of the biggest draw cards in museums. And I think that just goes to show how fascinated people are with how people dressed in the past and they can relate to it. Right. That's a great Great comment because you do, you always see these fashion exhibitions that have huge crowds and Mm -hmm. people are so fascinated. And, you know, with the Met Gala here in the States, you know, the fashion show ahead of time is what people are really so interested in, how these people make themselves stand out on the red carpet. So that's great. Yes, the history of fashion is really part of all of us and something we can relate to. So let's talk a little bit about your book, because actually that's how I first met you is through your book, which is so fabulous. Um, And the title is Shaping Femininity, Foundation Garments, the Body and Women in Early Modern England. And it is available on Kindle if that title grabs you as much as it did me. And the paperback edition will soon be available in the U.S. Um, It's available now for pre-order. So... I really love that idea of shaping femininity. Can you tell us how you came up with that? That's just such a wonderful sort of entry into this time period. The early modern period has so many things going on, but to think about how the clothing shaped 
the way women behaved and lived and all of that. So tell us about that world through that lens. Yeah, of course. It, it's funny, you know, I've been asked a few times since the book came out, um, what made you decide to to focus on um, foundation garments? So foundation garments are um, what we now call corsets, um, what in the 19th century were crinolines. I think that's what most people are probably familiar with, sort of uh, these big hoop skirts um, and corsetry. And in the period I look at, they were called bodies um, and farthingales. Um, and so, yeah, people have asked me, how did you come to that topic? It, it's really funny. It made me have to think about it. And I still don't really know the answer to, to it. <laughs> I think like most people, I was just fascinated with um, corsetry. I think corsetry is something that most people find quite interesting, um, quite controversial as well. Um, these garments which have been framed in various times of sort of oppressive, um, you know, why did women wear them? Um, why did women choose to wear them? Why do women still choose to wear them? And so I, I think I sort of fell down that rabbit hole. And then I um, realized that not a lot of work had been done on them in the early modern period. So particularly in the 16th and the 17th centuries, there's been quite a lot of work done on obviously corsetry in the 19th century and, you know, a bit in the 18th century as well, when they were called stays. So I sort of got down that rabbit hole of these types of garments. Um, but I also knew I wanted to tell a history of women during the early modern period. Um, one of the books that I read when I was, you know, an undergraduate and it really struck me um, was Laura Gowing's book called Common Bodies. And it was about um, women's bodies and women's experiences within their bodies in the early modern period and how we can uh detect you know traces of that from different types of source material obviously there's not a lot of female voices that have survived from this period so yeah I sort of just wanted to bring um, the study of dress and the study of women together and I felt like looking at women's history through the lens of uh, dress particularly these foundation garments which have shaped the female body for the better half of nearly 400 years would be a really interesting way to uh, assess um, the way that women were expected to look, to act, um, reactions to women when they wore certain things and then, you know, digging further, why did people react in that way? Uh, so, yeah, that's where shaping femininity comes from. So the idea of these garments being shaping garments, but also as um, using them as a way to look at how ideas of femininity change over time because they're not static, you know, even ideas of beauty, for example, are quite different now to when they were to when my mother was young in the 70s so um, that's sort of where this idea came from for the book and the title as well that's great so I know that different shapes and if you think about you know images that we've all seen portraits we've seen from sort of the early 16th century throughout the century women's silhouette does change and then into the 17th century it continues to change how did the change in the shape of these women's outfits affect maybe the way they walked or what they were able to do or how they carried themselves? How does it affect a woman's life, the way her body is sort of shaped or molded into a particular expected image? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so my book covers the period 1550 to 1700. So it sort of picks up in the mid 16th century when these garments um, are first starting to be worn uh, quite commonly. Well, farthingales anyway, um, the first sort of true uh, corsets in terms of boned bodies don't come around in England until the, the 1590s. But so the silhouette in the 16th century, I think most people would be um, – aware of it is in the middle part of the century it's sort of this cone-shaped farthingale um and then sort of a stiffened bodice but at, at this point they weren't really stiffened with boning in terms of corsetry it was more stiff fabrics and then that sort of changes throughout the elizabethan period um it, her her image gets or her body i should say gets more and more extreme so by the 1590s you have these huge puffy sleeves you've got a very conical shaped torso stiffened 
with um, whalebone. And then you have sort of these large, um, no longer cone-shaped farthingales, but what were called French farthingales, which sort of came quite out um, at the hips. And then sort of this where from the skirts fell from there. And then that's really the most extreme silhouette of the period um, that I look at. And then throughout the 17th century, um, with the Jacobean period, you've still got these large farthingales, but really by the 1620s or 30s, you've mainly just got rolls around the waist and they stay pretty small. So, you know, changing slightly in size throughout the 17th century, but um, bodies become very common during the 17th century. And by the end of the 17th century, or by the middle of the 17th century anyway, I sort of show in my book that um, non-elite women are also wearing these garments. And it's a really interesting question, um, you know, how these different silhouettes uh, influence the way that women lived their lives or um, the way that it reflected the way that women were supposed to look or act. So um, I guess a lot of people probably wonder, okay, well, why were these garments around in the first place? Uh, and that really has to do with um, elite courtly ideas of um, the aristocratic body. So not just women's bodies, um, men's bodies were also held to these sort of various types of standards as well. And, and men had, um, you know, garments such as doublets, which were often quite stiffened or bombast, which is padded to create a certain sort of figure. So men also did wear sort of um, shaping garments, um, not quite to the extreme as women. But it's really to do with these ideas of um, gracefulness. So um, anyone who has worn a corset or um, a pair of bodies or stays from this period, I'm sure probably knows, it, it makes you um, hold yourself in a certain way. Um, there was a piece of bodies and stays called a busk, which was a piece of wood or metal that was put in a channel down the front of the garment. And that really stops you being able to slouch. Um, a lot of garments sort of pull your shoulders back a bit as well. So it creates this sort of imposing, confident body, which is what the aristocratic body was supposed to be and supposed to stand for, because obviously it was representing a class of people who held power. Um, and then the farthingale was also really um, all about wealth. So it reflected the um, ideas at the time about um, aristocracy and wealth and how women should reflect the wealth of their families. So obviously in England during this time, um, women didn't really have financial freedom unless they were widows, for example. Um, so, you know, they were really representing their, their families, their husbands, their fathers, their brothers. And so having a woman with such a large skirt, um, underskirt, over which you need more fabric for the overskirts, really sort of projected these ideas of, of wealth. Um, and it's really interesting because in my book I talk about how over the 17th century um, these ideas are sort of embraced by the non-elites and the non-elites start to use these garments to try and I guess co-opt some of these ideas that about power, about beauty, about gracefulness, um, social advancement, that, you know, are sort of encapsulated by these garments that were created within the courts of Europe. But they also take on their own meanings for non-elite women as well. Um, but, you know, it, it is definitely to do with uh, ideas of social mobility and advancement. Um, and so that's sort of the social ideas of the period that these garments reflect about how women should be and how women should look. Um, which, you know, women also participated in themselves. It's not just sort of men forcing these things onto women. Um, men's garments also reflected these ideas. Um, but in terms of your question about how this, like, literally affected a woman's everyday life, that's really interesting because that's something in my book. I've uh, A big part of my book is historical reconstruction. So um, using my sewing skills um, and my knowledge of techniques from the period, um, I reconstructed uh, four pairs of bodies and two farthingales. Um, and I, the, the purpose of that exercise was to investigate these ideas of, um, of movement, of restriction, of size. And so I put these garments on female models um, and asked them to, you know, bend over, to sit down, to do all these types of things. And it actually found that these garments... Um, didn't really impact uh, 
a woman's life in the way that we I sometimes think they did. Um, there's definitely, you know, if you tight laced yourself, yes, it might affect your breathing. It might affect, um, you know, your ability to do certain things. But I think we forget that there were lacings on these garments that women, uh, and that's sort of something that was borne out in the experiments. Okay, so if you loosen it a little bit, you still maintain the sort of silhouette that you want, but it allows you more freedom of movement, of breathing. Um, there are all different like sizes and styles of these garments and different styles restrict different parts of your body. Um, I mean, the main restriction I found, which isn't just, I guess, uh, unique to these garments was, um, so styles of clothing for women in the mid 17th century, for example, come off the shoulder because they wanted to sort of show their shoulders and their, their chest. Um, and that actually restricts arm movement quite a lot. But that's got nothing to do with the fact that this is a boned garment. So, yeah, there was these really interesting little things that I found. Um, and I think overall we should think of, yes, these these garments did um, influence the way that women went about their day, but not in this oppressive way that I think we usually think about in modern times because we're not used to wearing garments like this. Right. And I really appreciate you bringing that up because – I think, you know, 400 years from now, people might look at our clothing and think, oh, why in the world did they wear that? So we need to realize that these people were wearing them at a particular time for a particular reason. But I really, I'm so glad you brought up that notion of having actually made some yourself and had some models wear them and move around and see what they were able to do to realize that yes, they may they may not have been the most comfortable thing you've ever worn, but there were adjustments. And that brings me to another point. Most of these garments came in multiple pieces, right? So you could lace up a little looser or add a sleeve in a slightly different place. How were the garments maybe different in construction in that way than maybe something we're used to? I mean, we put on a gown, a nice dress. It's all one piece. How were the garments different in the 16th and 17th century? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think as well, um, you know, it goes to this idea that you mentioned that uh, I think we have to stop <laughs> holding historical dress to modern standards because it's so different mm -hmm. and it existed in a completely different context. Um to one that we're used to now. So yes, um, clothing during the early modern period was very functional in terms of it had to fulfill multiple functions in dress. So as you said, now most of our clothing is, uh, is one piece. Whereas in the past, in the early modern period, uh, for example, most sleeves were able to be detached. So they were detachable sleeves. And this was so you could wear, um, you know, you might have two gowns, but five pairs of sleeves and you could change up your look by putting on different pairs of sleeves. Um, in terms of bodies, the, the garment that I talk about in my book, um, during the 17th century, um, unlike later sort of corsets and even stays in the 18th century, which are back lacing, um, during the 17th century in England, anyway, the majority of these garments are front lacing. Um, and not only does that make it easier to dress yourself, um, but by making something front lacing, there was also a piece that was placed underneath called a stomacher. So a stomacher is a triangular um, piece, a bo obviously a boned piece that is placed under the lacing at the front of the garment. And that really um, <clears throat> allowed you to uh, adjust the size of the garment um, throughout the day throughout the month as, you know, women's bodies fluctuate um, due to hormonal changes and that sort of thing, due to pregnancy, for example, um, and weight gain and loss. So you didn't need a new pair of bodies just because, um, you know, you were pregnant, um, you know, especially for the first, you know, part of the pregnancy, you could just let out the lacings over this over the stomacher or if you happen to gain a bit of weight or lose a bit of weight for whatever reason you didn't have to go out and buy a new garment um but i think you know it also goes to to show that a lot of our clothing now we buy off the rack and very few people unless it's quite an expensive garment would you know or a wedding dress for example would, would get something tailored and altered 
But clothing during this period, um, there was a ready-made clothing trade during, as definitely during the 17th century, um, and that became more and more popular over time. But for most people, most people had their garments tailor-made. So it was to fit their exact body measurements. Um, there's multiple evidence that I found, not just in relation to these garments that I'm looking at, that I look at in my book, but, you know, multiple different types of clothing of things being altered of, um, uh, for size, for example, there's a pair of bodies in my book that I talk about that have clearly been altered because they were, um, either they, they had a new owner who was bigger than the original person or, Maybe it was a teenager who had grown a bit. And, you know, so they've got extra panels placed in them that have been done later to show, and that shows that they've been altered for a different body shape. Um, there's evidence of things being altered because they don't fit properly anymore um, because the boning, for example, in a, in a pair of bodies has um, become, I guess, too soft or has broken. So there's sort of evidence of that being replaced. So, yeah, clothing during the early modern period was was very functional um, or multifunctional, I should say. Um, you know, different sleeves, different stomachers, different. You even had a thing called a forepart, for example, which was um, a very rich piece of triangular fabric that was placed in women's skirts at the front. And that was so not only could you tack that onto the front of your underskirt um, and take it off and put it on another skirt, but it also meant that the petticoat underneath at the back, for example, and this still happens in the 18th century as well, you could make that out of very plain fabric because it was never going to be seen. And you just have this really rich silk brocade or something like that at the front. So it makes it look like you've made your whole underskirt from this really rich, expensive fabric, but really you've only made the front section of it and you can place that on another skirt as well. So there's a lot of yeah, little things like that with early modern clothing, which make it very multifunctional. I love that idea about the clothing being functional because often to us, it seems sort of like a quote costume that mm -hmm. it's just for show, but actually, as you've described here and in your book, there are so many functions and the clothing was worn by particular people for particular reasons. And the idea that you could change your sleeves or change out that panel in the front or your stomacher to have a different style or present a little bit of a different image or just get some more wear out of some of these items and, you know, maybe save some money. And as you say, the back of your underskirt, not so fancy, but boy, that front panel is dazzling. And that's, yeah. that's a really great, I mean, we do that in our own way now, but that's a great thing to remember when we see some of these outfits in the portraits. So let's let's just imagine um, because some of the holiday court, the Christmas court in the royal, you know, court of Elizabeth or of James the First, they were they were quite spectacular times where sometimes a person of an elite status might be invited to attend court over the holidays, mm. and this was your chance to catch. <laughs> someone's eye, you know, a particularly highly placed person, or maybe even the king or queen. So what might someone do to sort of jazz up or what was the best look? How could they really strut their stuff for something like that? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. And, and I think, um, I mean, obviously in the book, I talk specifically about women, but this goes for men as well. When you went to court, you the whole uh, the court environment was made so that you could be seen. You wanted people to look at you. You looked at other people. It was all about um, putting on a show. And um, so, um, for example, um, in the 16th century, Balthazar Castiglione talked about this thing called sprezzatura, which is all about, um, you know, when I explain it to my students, for example, um, it was explained to me and I explained it to my students this way. It's like the art of being cool. So uh, I guess a modern example would be like um, bed hair, for example. You know, this style that looks like you've just like rolled out of bed, um, but really people spend an hour styling their hair to make it look like they've just rolled out of bed. So that's what sprezzatura is. And that was a huge concept at the courts of Elizabeth I and of James, um, James I of England. Um, and throughout Europe during this period. So this art of looking cool, so this art of um, 
you want to be noticed, you want to be um, noticed for the right reasons, but you don't want to look like you've put too much effort in. So um, one way that I guess uh, you didn't, so it was this fine line. You wanted to look a certain way and you wanted to catch people's attention, but you didn't want to go too far because that then might um, lead to ridicule. So there were certain ways that obviously, for example, with women, farthingales, that's a huge way to get noticed at the court. And that's sort of part of the function of this garment, right? It's to really um, slightly increase the amount of, well, increase the amount of space that a female body, the lower half of a female body takes up. Um, but by doing that, it means you also have to have more fabric in your gown or in your petticoat, for example. And that goes to what I was saying before, these ideas of wealth. So if you have um, a large farthingale, you need many more yards of fabric to put into the skirt, which then sort of gives this impression, okay, like this is a rich person because they can afford all that fabric. And I think that's where um, a lot of people don't realise that um, because clothing is so cheap now, labour and fabric is very cheap in modern clothing. But in the past, fabric, I mean, labour was still pretty cheap. Um, but fabric was incredibly expensive. Um, and so really it was a form of stored wealth. And that's why we don't have a lot of clothing that survived from this period because people, once something had fallen out of fashion, they had it remade into the newest fashion. So they really did recycle fabrics until um, you couldn't use them anymore. And that is also because some fabrics, so I would say one way that you could catch somebody's eye at court um, after, um, well, actually, this is more in James I's um, reign because during Elizabeth I's reign, you had things called sumptuary laws, which were laws that restricted who could wear what types of fabrics in their clothing. So it didn't restrict, in England, it didn't restrict garments. In other European countries, it did. But in England, it just restricted what ranks of people were able to wear what types of fabric. But by James I's reign, this didn't really exist anymore. People weren't really, were ignoring it. James didn't, couldn't really be bothered to enforce it because he had favourites at court um, that weren't sort of these high aristocratic figures that he wanted, um, that wouldn't have been able to wear certain types of fabrics, but he wanted them to. So he had really no reason to um, maintain these laws. So they kind of fall out of favour during his reign. But throughout the 17th century, I would say um, one type of garment that you would uh one type of, uh, sorry, fabric that you'd wear in your garment would be cloth of gold or cloth of silver. And that is literally cloth that is woven with metallic threads of gold and silver. So not only was it incredibly expensive, so it would obviously signal that you were very, very wealthy. But I think we have to remember, you know, we have to situate ourselves there. And in the candlelight of the court, the metallic threads in cloth of gold and silver would glimmer in the light. And so it would create this, you know, beautiful sort of effect in candlelight. And the same with um, during throughout the 17th century um, and even earlier. I'm working on stuff in the 17th century at the moment, so this is what's sort of in the fore of my mind. Um, for example, Henrietta Maria, um, Charles I's queen, um, but even, you know, any type of court lady, so much of their clothing was um, was decorated with silver lace, so silver galloon lace, uh, sort of gilt braids, um, metallic embroidery, all of these types of um, little details in the fabric that would catch the candlelight and sort of make you glimmer. So that would be, yeah, I would say that was a big way that people are caught um, throughout, you know, the early modern period um, dressed to be noticed um, and because they were the only ones that could really afford it as well. Great. Oh, I was also I was just going to say with men, for example, um, you would have, uh, you know, certain types of doublets, for example. Um, there were certain fashion crazes that were short, sort of short-lived. But I think participating in those fashion crazes showed that you – were up to date. For example, in um, the Elizabethan period, there was something called a peace cod belly, uh, which was, I sort of describe it as like um, the, the dad bod. So, but in a doublet form, it gives you a bit of a, um, almost a bit of a beer gut. Um, but it was, yeah, quite fashionable, but for a short amount of time.
So, yeah, going to court and showing that you are aware of these fashions and participating in them, even if they're short-lived, would also be a way to be noticed. That is wonderful. So those two examples are just so easy for us to understand. And the idea of the gold thread and the silver thread and how that would glisten in all kinds of light and in the, you know, the waning sunlight and the sunset and then the candlelight, that really seems like it would be a spectacular image. And also, I love the idea that you've got a, you know, you may have a short window for this fashion, so you've got to jump on it if you're going to have that beer gut, which of course I guess now would not be fashionable, but, but the, the notion of changing fashion and you show up in court in the latest fashion, then you're clearly, you know, you have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. So let's imagine that a very wealthy woman wanted to have one of these outfits with different pieces, all these different pieces so that she would maybe shimmer in the court and catch people's eye how you mentioned these are not available just down at the store how do you get something made what are some of the steps in getting one of these outfits that would have this kind of effect yeah that's a great question um clothing yeah during this period you couldn't just go down to the shops and (laughs) and buy it off the rack it was um and I, i it was much it was much more of an involved process and You know, when I think about, when I write about this and I'm researching this, I find it such a shame that we aren't as involved in our clothing and its making anymore because I think we've really lost the appreciation for the workmanship that goes into making clothing um, and the, the value of clothing, you know, when we can buy something that's a fast fashion item for, you know, $5 that we paid somebody in a third world country, um, you know, a few cents to make. So yeah, it was quite different during the early modern period and people were very involved um, with the making of their clothing and they had a lot of um, what what is termed material literacy. So they understood different materials and how different materials worked and what was and what wasn't good for clothing, for certain types of clothing, Etc. So they were really, you know, involved in a conversation with the people who made their clothes or supplied the materials for their clothes. So if you were going, if you were a woman um, during this period and you wanted a new outfit made for court, the first thing um, you would do after you know what you want to wear, or even actually before you want to wear, um, is that you would go to two people, well, two types of um, trades. You would first go to your tailor. So um, women's clothing for the majority of the 16th and 17th century was made by tailors. So let's just, we'll just pretend that all your basic undergarments, you already have all of those because they were just worn with everything. So you had like a linen smock or shift and sort of you might have some silk stockings and garters. Um, So you've already got all that under that sort of basic layer that sits right next to your skin. So you would go to a tailor and you would probably discuss with them what you wanted made how, you know, the tailors were very much on the pulse of the latest styles and fashions. Um, So they would probably advise you. And then what you would do is after talking to the tailor and the tailor might say, okay, you need this many um, yards of this fabric, this many L's. L's was a a fabric measurement back in the period of this type of fabric. What you would do is then you yourself or somebody, you know, in your household would go to um, the cloth merchants and then you would buy the cloth. So you had mercers, you had woolen drapers, you had silkmen, you had all these different professions. Um, So you would go and you would buy, you would, you know, look at their wares and buy the type of cloth that you wanted to go in your garment. Um, Then you might, for example, go to a haberdasher to get all the little notions and trims, again, probably on the advice of the tailor. Um, you might go to, um, a lace man to buy different types of lace, however you wanted to, to trim, you know, or accessorize your garment. So then what you would take, or they would send it directly to the tailor that would go back to the tailor and the tailor would make your garment. Um, you would probably go in for several fittings to make sure it fits correctly. So they would make what we still do now, um, when you make modern clothing, um, tailor make modern clothing so a toile which is uh 
sort of a mock-up of the garment that you use for fit. So they would do that. We have evidence, for example, um, from Elizabeth the First wardrobe, her tailors talking about um, sort of uh, linen pattern pieces that they'd made from for the queen, which was obviously made to fit, you know, to make sure that the shape of the garment and the fit of the garment was correct. And then that would become the lining of the garment, for example. So you didn't get rid of that fabric. You would incorporate it into the garment. Um, so, yeah, you would go back for several fittings um, before you were happy with the garment. Um, and that is pretty much how you would access, you know, how you would go about getting a garment made in this period. Um, but what's quite interesting is over the course of the 17th century, you have uh, different special uh, sort of subspecialty trades that that arise. So, for example, in my book, I examined um the rise of body makers and farthingale makers. So these are specialized trades that um, specialize just in making bodies and farthingales. So instead of, if you lived in a rural area, you probably would still go to your tailor. It's only in the sort of latter half of the 17th century that you start to get body makers um, popping up everywhere in England. Um, but, you know, you would get your outer garment made by your tailor, but you might also separately go to your body maker or your farthingale maker. If you're in somewhere like London, you would go to the fashion sort of district around Cheapside, which is where a lot of these body makers and farthingale makers were located. So you would go to them and they would make your garment. But then the tailor would also have to be in correspondence with them to make sure that the outer garments would fit over the undergarments as well. So it's this quite complicated process of going back and forward between different artisans, between different cloth merchants, between buying different sorts of laces and trims and stuff like that. But it also meant that people were very, very involved in their clothing and it was sort of this cooperative process between listening to tailors and their specialties, but also, you know, you would be like, well, what if I want this? Can I put this on the garment? So people, yeah, were very much involved in um, the making of their clothing during this period. That is wonderful. And it certainly gives us a terrific view of how well involved people were, how much they had to learn so that they could ask the right questions and know the right tailors and all of the right folks to work with. But you can imagine by the time you got that garment done, you would be so attached to it because mm -hmm. you had done all this other work and you'd worked with all these people and gotten it just right. So that is a wonderful, wonderful insight. And it's certainly something that you would not um, decide at the last minute. You were having to put some time into your planning to make sure you had time for all these pieces to come together. Yes, definitely. That, and even if you wanted to just have something um, altered, like you might not have something completely new, but you might want to refresh an older garment, you know. So, um, again, that would still involve a lot of going to different, you know, haberdashers or lacemen and picking different trims and different ways to accessorize it or, you know, maybe going to a tailor and being like, can we remove this part of the garment and place in a different part and things like that. So, yeah, people were very, very much involved. Well, and that's wonderful. I mean, as you said, they recycled all these garments, practically all of them in different parts of them. And that is sort of admirable. I mean, I think we could all appreciate that. And the notion of rather than just starting over, adjusting something, adopting something and, and making it into something new. That is so great. And you mentioned that these are some of the things you share in your book, which is so fascinating. It just takes you into this world of 16th and 17th century England in a whole new way and introduces you to life in a whole new way. And I just love it. So thank you for highlighting some of those things for us. Now, what are you working on now, Sarah? Can you share some of your upcoming projects? Yeah, of course. And thank you so much for your kind words about the book. Um, I'm glad that, you know, it sort of gave you a different perspective on England during this period. Uh, so, yeah, I have a couple of new projects that I am currently doing simultaneously. When I get sick of looking at one, I, I go back to the other. Um, so my first project is, uh, and it sort of uh, has, well, both of these projects have come out of the research that I did for Shaping Femininity. So the first project is looking at the use of um, whaling materials in fashion, uh, because obviously one of the, the key materials used to make bodies and even farthingales 
in the early modern period was something called whalebone, which is what they call it at the time, but it's actually whale baleen. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever seen, um, for example, a humpback whale feeding. You know, you see this large mouth and it's full of these sort of bristles. That's whale baleen, which is uh, keratin. So it's made out of the same stuff as your fingernails. Um, so that was a, a, a new material, um, well, newish material um, to Europe in the 16th century um, and becomes, you know, part of not just, you know, corsets and hoop skirts, but it it is used in so many different fashion garments throughout the 16th and the 17th and the 18th century. So my period is sort of covering the 16th, 17th and a bit of the 18th century. Um, And I'm really looking at the fashion industry in relation to um, the global trade and the commercialization of whaling because it's it's really in the 16th century that you that whaling becomes a commercial industry and you know and is a commercial industry until the middle of the 19th century sorry it's the middle of the 20th century um, you know even until the 80s probably um so i yeah i'm really interested in looking at these connections between um between fashion and, and global trade and um i guess uh, I'm becoming a little bit of an economic historian in this project. <laughs> um, so I'm really interested in sort of tracing the journey that this material takes from whale to wardrobe and the different people that are involved in that process, the different, um, the, you know, the, there's whole professions and jobs that are created just to, um, uh, I guess, um, produce things with this to, um how would you say to you, you know, to make this material usable in fashion? Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in those sorts of connections. So that's one project that I have. Um, but my other project, which is why I said before, my mind is sort of stuck in the 17th century in terms of looking at clothing and how it's made. Um, my new project is looking at um, the people who made um, clothing for England Stuart queens during the 17th century, particularly um, the women who made, um, I, I'm sort of framing it around who bought, sold, um, sorry, sorry, who made, sold, bought and cared for the queen's clothing. So um, both men and women, but I'm particularly interested in the women that I'm finding in their wardrobe accounts. So that sort of, uh, so what I'm doing at the moment is going through all of their wardrobe accounts. So that's Anne of Denmark, Henrietta Maria, Catherine of Braganza, and um, Anne Stewart, so Queen Anne. So looking at their wardrobe accounts, um, looking at who the artisans are in their wardrobe accounts. So I guess looking a little bit less at these queens, but sort of looking more behind the scenes about who is making their clothing, who's who's looking after their clothing, how did you wash, how did they care for their clothing, um, and sort of looking at the the rise of female artisans and suppliers in, in their bills. So they're the two projects I've got at the moment. Well, those both sound great. I don't know how you could get bored enough to turn off from one, but I bet it's really exciting to turn on to the other when you do. So- where can we find more about you and what you're working on and how can, you know, my readers or my listeners, sorry, your readers of the book, but how can my listeners learn more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, of course. So um, I have my own website. So um, where I regularly blog about, you know, certain things, there's so much I come across all the time that I can't fit into publications. So I like to be able to put it on my blog so people can at least learn from it um so that's sarah with a h a bendel.com so s-a-r-a-h-a-b-e-n-d-a-l-l.com um i also have an instagram so my instagram handle is sarah bendel underscore fashion history so you can find me there and that's where i post a lot about my reconstructions and uh, i you know I, i've done reconstructions for the book but i am also generally um Experimental history is something that I do. So I post a lot about that there. Um, But yeah, my book is out in the US, Canada, um, and Canada on the 30th of December in hardback and paperback. But it's out at the moment in um, on Kindle and ebook. So right. 
Yeah. So for people like me who just could not even wait till the 30th of December, <laughs> I need it now. So yes, great on Kindle. But now I, I'm, I am excited. I like to buy the physical copy as well. So I will have them both. It is a well, beautiful, like Bloomsbury have done an amazing job with um, the physical book. It's full color images throughout. Um, yeah, it's really oh. beautiful. As an author, it's like, I, I saw the book and I was like, Yes, they've done an amazing job. So highly recommend getting the paperback version if you can. <laughs> All right. Well, let me say if you're, as the author, if you're that happy with publication, that is great. That is really great to hear. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such a treat. It's always great for me to meet people who give us a new way of looking at history and at some of the, you know, periods that we might know a little bit about, but give us a new way into those periods to learn more. And I just love the idea of looking at this clothing as, as fat, as functional, you know, this idea that these, these pieces of clothing then were functional in some of the same ways that our clothing is today. It's different, but we wear different clothing for different reasons, and so did they. So it's a wonderful way to feel closer to the past. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm always happy to talk about early modern fashion. A big thank you to Sarah Bendal for teaching us about the multiple functions of fashion through history and for that special insight into the art of being cool. Something we'll all be using in the new year, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to ringing in next year with all of you. So let's spend 2022 shaking up history together.